So, Prof. Janssen, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. You're very welcome. And before we move into the future, can you quickly tell us a little bit about your background? Where did yes. You... Yes. Sure. I grew up in the Cape Flats in South Africa, which, which is generally an area, uh, you know, of 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 uh, uh, you know deprivation, uh, uh, working class uh, people, a um, uh, uh, lot of gang violence in this part of the of the Cape Flats. So you know, a, a very very tough um, area in which to grow up, and still is. Uh, I was very lucky to have parents who were very devout Christians, so they raised me in a very in a bubble, as I often call it, in which there was a very strong sense of you know family values, of uh, a spiritual commitment, of you know living a sacrificial life uh, in the service of others. So around me, I could see you know the alcoholism, the drugs, the the violence, and so on. That was not in that was very visible. Mm -hmm. But within me, and certainly within our house, there was an incredible sense of peace, of of, of uh, focus, and of, um, of of and an awareness that the world is more than just your material surroundings, but also your spiritual, you know, uh, uh, ambitions. So, so that, in a nutshell, is how I grew up. Yeah, and tell us, did you have a dream career when you grew up? Oh. No, no, no. Remember, your horizons were very much set by what was possible through the lens of your parents and your friends and family. So I, I didn't even know what a university was. I didn't know it existed. Uh, I sort of stumbled, you know, because of friends onto a university campus, and got registered and all of that. So, and so my goal was just hopefully to get a, a, a job in one of the factories around uh, the Cape Flats or you know, if I'm lucky, a nice clerical job or something, uh, a white collar job. But I had no, there was no, there was no reason to be ambitious, you know, um, uh, at all. And so uh, I I just had a series of lucky breaks, I suppose, and, um, and, yeah. in my life. And Prof, can you tell us who inspired you in your early days? Yeah, <clears throat> my main inspiration was my my teachers, and particularly a teacher, a Latin teacher, who took me aside one day while I was when I went was playing soccer, which is the only reason I actually went to school, which is to mm -hmm. enjoy playing soccer uh, with my mates. And 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 he told me I had potential. I had not known what the word meant. It was before Google. And asked my mother, and she said, "You know, it means you don't have to play soccer for the rest of your life." And and it had made such an impact on me that a teacher thought I was better than I thought I was. Uh, and 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 that pretty much was one of the big reasons that I started to become more studious, started to become more committed, and happened to have some friends who were incredibly ambitious, more than I was, who also helped me to, <clears throat> to be more focused on academic work and not just play, play, play. So um, that was a big inspiration. My mother was a big inspiration to me. Very, very hardworking woman who, um, if it wasn't for apartheid, I'm quite sure she'd have been a fairly senior person in the profession of nursing. Um, but of course, you're, you know, so just uh, the example of a life and particularly the habit of really working hard. Uh, was something that she installed in me. And my father was a, a different kind of role model in terms of his generosity towards those who had even less than we had and his gentle demeanor and the fact that he never threw a tantrum, the fact that he never argued with anyone, let alone his wife. So I was, I, I had people, and then of course in the church itself that I grew up in, I had people all over the place who were mm -hmm. influential in giving me a strong sense of values, but also as I said, with this teacher, a sense of there's more to you than uh, you yourself uh, tend to think. And and Prof, looking back over your leadership career, um, was there a turning point or maybe a couple of turning points where uh, things could have gone different? Oh, yeah, very often. You know, like when I dropped out of first year of university, it was 1976. 
Uh, there was the Soweto originating riots in the country of students, and and obviously we joined them in protests and what have you. Um, uh, and the and and my lecturers were incredibly racist and and discouraging at university. So I dropped out, and I went to look for a job. Uh, just to get away from the hardship of going to university, traveling for three, four hours a, a day, and 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 not having parents with money, you know, to 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 keep me there. And if my mother hadn't sent me back to campus with one of her relatives, I don't think I'll be with would be with you today. So that was one particular moment that. I think could have gone either way, you know, and and then just navigating going from home to school and the many skirmishes that I remember in which you could have been fatally wounded and so on and so forth. I remember that very clearly. So yeah, and and you know, I did go back to university. I did manage to escape harm, and 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 I did eventually have people who said. You know, years are also worth betting on, and put some money into my education, and and for all of that, I'm very grateful. And and Prof, what would you say is driving you today? You know, what drives me in my 18-hour day is a very very strong sense of the fact that I have been privileged. I have been blessed. I studied at some of the best universities in the world. And therefore I have a responsibility to give back. I have a responsibility not to amass wealth for myself, but to give it back to students who need scholarships or to give it back to mentors who need training. So my entire life for a long time has been premised on this notion that because you had so many people invest in your life, you have a responsibility from the platform that I have, whether it was as a dean or a vice chancellor, or now just as a regular professor, to use the platform of influence uh, to make other people's lives better, regardless of who they are. And so that's what I live my life for. And Prof, looking into the future, what does the future of leadership mean to you? It means, <clears throat> I suppose, as one gets into your 60s, you know, you become very aware of the fact that you need to, re to prepare your replacement leadership. So I spent a huge amount of time training future professors. I spent a huge amount of time training community leaders. I spent a bulk of my time training principals uh, uh, and, and other senior teachers for them to become, first of all, ethical leaders, secondly, to become competent leaders, uh, thirdly, to become visionary leaders and sacrificial leaders. In other words, I'm, there is a very sharp awareness that with the time I've left in my career and in my life to, to, to prepare people who will be better than you are as a leader, and that's what I do. And Prof, looking back over your, your leadership journey, what would you consider most important for building future leaders? I think the most important thing is the credibility you have as a leader. So whether you're a professor, your credibility as a scholar, whether you are a change maker in communities, the ways in which you give from your own resources to improve other people's lives. In other words, people only lead you, <clears throat> or follow you to the extent that your personal life, your professional life, your political life is uh, exemplary. I'm not suggesting, of course, that leaders are perfect. None of us are. I certainly have a lot of flaws. But I do believe that people watch me 24-7 and ask, is this person somebody worth following? Or is the values that this person professes, you know, whether it's for social change or for political renewal or for educational uh, you know, uh, 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 reform is the example of the leader. Some, not the words, uh, is something worth emulating. And so I'm very conscious of that role in society. And prop, these are challenging times for future leaders. <laughs> the world, the world seems to stumble from one crisis into the next. What are some of the biggest challenges you would you would advise future leaders should anticipate? and expect in their career? I think one of the biggest challenges in a world that is, as you know, uh, struggling with existential questions like climate change 
uh, in South Africa struggling with, with really important questions around poverty, development, inequality, and so on. One of the most important challenges is to develop leaders who are countercultural, who go the other way. In South Africa, so our cabinet, for example, is an active crime scene. Uh, the leadership at the top of the country is is so compromised, you know, by its own corruption, that it is very, very hard to be a whistleblower. It is very, very hard to do the opposite of what the most visible leaders in your society do. And so for me, one of the big things is to develop that tenacity, that, that single-mindedness, that um, uh, preparedness to be different, uh, as I said, to be countercultural in the face of uh, a decline. Right, and uh, in terms of skills and maybe new skills for future leaders to uh, to survive and thrive in in this new world, are there any new skills you would suggest future leaders should learn and adopt? Yeah, I think you know um, the obvious skills are obviously there. You need to be competent, no matter what your discipline. Uh, you need to be confident. Uh, as a person, but I think the new skills very much in a changing world is to learn how to lead in in the context of crises. That requires a set of skills that are very personal skills like temperamental skills, the ability not to be easily, you know, uh, 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 hijacked by other people's ambitions, the ability to stay true to your core values regardless of what's happening in the society around you. The ability to to read uh, the future and and to plan accordingly. The ability to build teams of very diverse people in order for them to deliver on on the goals of of whatever unit you lead. Those are difficult skills. People call them soft skills. They're bloody hard skills, you know. And so, being able to develop those, I started off with temperamental uh, skills. That ability to be balanced. Uh, to 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 read the room, <laughs> to uh, anticipate the future. Those are difficult things to do. Part of it, of the reason is because a lot of that is intuitive, but part of that also requires you to be teachable as a leader. And Prof, as a mentor to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored an upcoming leader and that person took your advice to heart? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, oh, I can give you hundreds of those stories. One, one of which is is the young man that I, that I, you know, did so well academically, but was in a very poor school and community, a very violent community, and and I funded his studies, and he became a Mandela Road scholar. He became a leader in his in the education community. Became a great inspiration to thousands of others, and 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 and. Uh, you know what was amazing about him is how often he came back to me to say thank you very much uh, for for giving me the opportunity to, you know, to be like you. And I always say to him, you have very low ambitions if you want to be like me. You need to be better than me. Mm-hmm. You have to set your own standard. You know, uh, that young man uh, sadly uh, um, was murdered in South Africa uh, a couple of months ago. But he's somebody who I always hold up as uh, that, given the opportunity, took the opportunity and made a massive difference in the country. And then, of course, they are lead, you know, uh, on the professorial side, um, many young people who are now deans, heads of departments, uh, 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 deputy vice chancellors, and so on, are people whom I had the privilege of teaching how to be a scholar leader, you know, in my business and, and, uh, and are known throughout the country and around the world as being great leaders in, in, in research and teaching. So yeah, I've been very, very lucky. But as I said, you know, the the real the real uh, thrill for me of preparing future leaders is when you see that they are much better than you at what you do. And Prof, looking back over your leadership career, are there any role models of your leadership that you've encountered and you would recommend future leaders should learn from? Yeah, so, so you know, for me, as I said, my mother was a very important leader because she taught me how to lead in the, in the midst of adversity. So I found enormous uh, strength. Uh, you know, on the literary side, I still take enormous courage and, uh, from a, an American 
uh, writer poet called Maya Angelou, for example, enormously powerful, quiet, humble, moving leader. Um, and, and so, so across the world, across cultures, I've always been blessed to be able to look up to people who uh, were fearless, who were not bought, you know, by the political and economic system, who were fiercely independent uh, as as thinkers and as doers. Um, <clears throat> you know, our former public protector, Tuli Madonsela, is enormous inspiration to me because of her ability to speak truth to power. So yeah, one is surrounded, you know, by uh, people who, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you, another fearless person who paid the price, you know, for uh, taking on power. Uh, there is no shortage, as you know, and I will leave out the obvious examples because they so often use, like Nelson Mandela and so on, mm -hmm. and point to others who are perhaps less visible but equally influential in inspiring uh, people like me. And Prof, where can our listeners follow you and how should they connect with you? Probably the best way. I've been very lucky to have 156,000 followers on Twitter. So I always say to people, you'll know what I'm thinking every morning if you go to JJ, capital J, capital J, underscore mm -hmm. Stellies. S T E L L I E S, which is the affectionate name for the University of Stellenbosch. So JJ underscore Stellies is 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 a way in which I very often post new thinking about leadership and new ideas about change and, and, and so on. And also some critical questions. Sometimes it's very hard questions, you know, right. which people get uh, 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 offended by, but questions nevertheless that I think is important. <laughs> for changing your community and indeed your country, if not your continent. And Prof, last but not least, what is your advice for the millions of learners out there who are looking to finish school, start a career? What are maybe one or two success story uh, 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 principles they should keep in mind? Oh, very simple. You are much smarter than you think. I wish I knew that when I was in grade school. I wish somebody had told me early on, that you don't measure your ability to do great things by what people tell you, by what your circumstances suggest about you, uh, but that you believe in inside of you because we're all endowed with this enormous ability. Now, we might not all be good at science and math. It might be art and culture. It might be cycling and boxing. We're not all good at the same thing, but find out what you're good at and you'll be surprised that you're actually much, much smarter than you think. Well, Prof, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom into the future of leadership and for inspiring so many future leaders. Thank you, sir.